Hi, my name is Tisha Meadows, and I'm going to be reading J.K. Rowling's Ichabod, chapters 28 and 29. I'm going to share the screen so that you can read along. Chapter 28, Ma Gruntner. Having made sure her front door was secure, Ma Gruntner pulled the sack off her new charge. Blinking in the sudden light, Daisy found herself in a narrow, rather dirty hallway face to face with a very ugly old woman who was dressed all in black, a large brown wart with hairs growing out of it on the tip of her nose. John, the old woman croaked without taking her eyes off Daisy, and a boy much bigger and older than Daisy with a blunt scowling face came shuffling into the hall, cracking his knuckles. Go and tell the Janes upstairs to put another mattress in their room. Make one of the little brats do it, grunted John. I haven't had breakfast. Ma Gruntner suddenly swung her heavy, heavy silver-handled cane at the boy's head. Daisy expected to hear a horrible thud of silver on bone, but the boy ducked the cane neatly, as though he had a lot of practice. Cracked his knuckles again and said suddenly, sullenly, all right, all right. He disappeared up some rickety stairs. What's your name, said Ma Gruntner, turning back to Daisy. Daisy, said Daisy. No, it isn't, said Ma Gruntner. Your name is Jane. Daisy would soon find out that Ma Gruntner did the same thing to every single child who arrived in her house. Every girl was rechristened Jane, and every boy was renamed John. The way the children reacted to be given a new name told Ma Gruntner exactly what she needed to know about how hard it was going to be to break that child's spirit. Of course, the very tiny children who came to Ma Gruntner simply agreed that their name was John or Jane and quickly forgot that they'd been called anything else. Homeless children and lost children who could tell that being John or Jane was the price of having a roof over their head were also quick to agree to the change. But every so often, Ma Gruntner met a child who wouldn't accept their new name without a fight. And she knew, before Daisy even opened her mouth, that the girl was going to be one of them. There was a nasty, proud look about the newcomer. And while skinny, she looked strong, standing there in her overalls with her fists clenched. My name, said Daisy is Daisy Dovetail. I was named after my mother's favorite flower. <laughs> Your mother's dead, said Ma Gretner, because she always told the children in her care that their parents were dead. It was best that the little wretches didn't think there was anybody to run to. That's true, said Daisy, her heart hammering very fast. My mother is dead, and so's your father, said Ma Gretner. The horrible woman seemed to swim before Daisy's eyes. She had nothing to eat since the previous lunchtime and had spent a night of terror in Prod's wagon. Nevertheless, she said in a cold, clear voice, my father's alive. I'm Daisy Dovetail and my father lives in Choville. She had to believe that her father was still there. She couldn't let herself doubt it because if her father was dead, then all the light would disappear from the world forever. No, he isn't, said Ma Gretner, raising her cane. Your father's dead as a doornail and your name is Jane. My name, began Daisy with a sudden whoosh. Ma Gretner's cane came swinging at her head. Daisy ducked as she seen, as she seen the big boy do, but the cane swung back again and this time it hit Daisy painfully on the air and knocked her sideways. Let's try that again, said Ma Gretner. Repeat after me, my father is dead and my name is Jane. I won't, shouted Daisy. And before the cane could swing back at her, she darted under Ma Gretner's arm and run off into the house, hoping that the back door might not have bolts on it. In the kitchen, she found two pale, frightened looking children, a boy and a girl, ladling a dirty green liquid into bowls and a door with just as many chains and padlocks as on it as the other. Daisy turned and ran back to the hall, 
dodged Maya Grotner and, and her cane, then sped upstairs where more thin, pale children were cleaning and making beds with threadbare sheets. Ma Gretner was already climbing the stairs behind her. Say it, croaked Ma Gretner. Say my father is dead and my name is Jane. My father's alive and my name is Daisy, shouted Daisy. Now spotting a hatch in the ceiling that she suspected led to an attic. Snatching a feather duster out of the hand of a scared girl, she poked the hatch. A rope ladder fell, which Daisy climbed pulling it up after her and slamming the attic door so that Ma Gretner and her cane couldn't reach her. She could hear the old woman cackling below and ordering a boy to stand guard over the hatch to make sure Daisy didn't come out. Later, Daisy would discover the children gave each other extra names so they knew which John or Jane they were talking about. The big boy now standing guard over the attic hatch was the same one Daisy had seen downstairs. His nickname among the other children was Basher John for the way he bullied the smaller children. Basher John was by way of being a deputy for Ma Gretner, and now he called up to Daisy, telling her children had died of starvation in that attic and that she'd find their skeletons if she looked hard enough. The ceiling of Ma Gretner's attic was low, was so low that Daisy had to crouch. It was also very dirty, but there was a small hole in the roof through which a shaft of sunlight fell. Daisy wriggled over to this and put her eye to it. Now she could see the skyline of Jeroboam. Unlike Choville, where the buildings were mostly sugar white, this was a city of dark gray stone. Two men were reeling along the street below, bellowing a popular drinking song. I drank a single bottle, and the Ichabod's a lie. I drank another bottle, I thought I heard it sigh. And now I've drank another, I can see it's linking by. The Ichabod is coming, so let's drink before we die. Daisy sat with her eye pressed against a spy hole for an hour until Ma Gretner came and banged on the hat with her cane. What is your name? Daisy Dovetail, bellowed Daisy. And every hour afterwards, the question came and the answer remained the same. However, as the hours wore by, Daisy began to feel lightheaded with hunger. Every time she shouted, Daisy Dovetail, back at Ma Gretner, her voice was weaker. At last she saw through her spy hole in the attic that it was becoming dark. She was very thirsty now, and she had to face the fact that if she kept refusing to say her name was Jane, there really might be a skeleton in the attic for Basher John to frighten other children with. So the next time Maud Gretner banged on the attic hatch with her cane and asked what Daisy's name was, she answered, Jane. And is your father alive? asked Ma Gretner. Daisy crossed her fingers and said, no. Very good, said Ma Gretner, pulling open the hatch so the rope ladder fell down. Come down here, Jane. When Daisy was standing beside her again, the old lady cuffed her around the air. That's for being a nasty, lying, filthy little brat. Now go drink your soup, wash up the bowl, and get to bed. Daisy gulped down a small bowl of cabbage soup, which was the nastiest thing she'd ever eaten, washed the bowl in the greasy barrel that Ma Gretner kept for doing dishes, then went back upstairs. There was a spare mattress on the floor of the girl's bedroom, so she crept inside while all the other girls watched her and got under the, the red bear blanket, fully dressed, because the room was very cold. Daisy found herself looking into the kind blue eyes of a girl her own age with a gaunt face. You lasted much longer than most, whispered the girl. She had an accent Daisy had never heard before. Later, Daisy would learn that the girl was a marshlander. What's your name? Daisy whispered. Your real name. The girl considered Daisy with those huge forget-me-not eyes. We're not allowed to say. I promise I won't tell, whispered Daisy. The girl stared at her. Just when Daisy thought she wasn't going to answer, the girl whispered, Martha. Pleased to meet you, Martha, whispered Daisy, 
I'm Daisy Dovetail, and my father's still alive. Chapter 29, Mrs. Beamish Worries. Back in Choville, Spittleworth made sure the story was circulated, but the Dovetail family had packed up in the middle of the night and moved to the neighboring country of Pluritania. Daisy's former teacher told her old classmates and Cankerby, the footman, informed all the palace servants. After he got home from school that day, Bert went and lay on his bed, staring up at the ceiling. He was thinking back to the days when he'd been a small, plump boy whom the other children called Butterball and how Daisy had always stuck up for him. He remembered their long ago fight in the palace courtyard and the expression on Daisy's face when he accidentally knocked her hopes of heaven to the ground on her birthday. Then Bert considered the way he spent his break times these days. At first, Bert had a sort of had sort of liked being friends with Roderick Roach because Roderick used to bully him and he was glad he stopped. But if he was truly honest with himself, Bert didn't really enjoy the same things that Roderick did. For instance, trying to hitch stray dogs with catapults or finding live frogs to hide in the girls' satchels. In fact, the more he remembered the fun he used to have with Daisy, the more he thought about how his face ached from fake smiling at the end of the day with Roderick, and the more Bert regretted that he never tried to repair his and Daisy's friendship. friendship. But it was too late now. Daisy was gone forever, gone to Pluritania. While Bert was lying on his bed, Miss Beamish sat alone in the kitchen. She felt almost as bad as her son. Ever since she'd done it, Mrs. Beamish had regretted telling the scullery maid that Mrs. Dub Mr. Dovetail had said about the Ichabod not being real. She'd been so angry at the suggestion that her husband might have fallen off his horse, she hadn't realized she was reporting treason until the words were out of her mouth and it was too late to call them back. She really hadn't wanted to get such an old friend into trouble, so she'd begged the scullery maid to forget what she'd said, and Mabel had agreed. Relieved, Mrs. Beamish turned around to take a large batch of maiden's dreams out of the oven, then spotted Cankerby, the footman, skulking in the corner. Cankerby was known to everyone who worked in the palace as a sneak and a tattletale. He had a knack of arriving noiselessly into rooms and peeping unnoticed through key keyholes. Mrs. Beamish didn't dare ask Cankerby how long he'd been standing there, but now, sitting alone at her own kitchen table, a terrible fear gripped her heart. Had news of Mr. Dovetail's treason been carried by Cankerby to Lord Spittleworth? Was it possible that Mr. Dovetail had gone, not to Pluritania, but to prison? The longer she thought about it, the more frightened she became, until finally, Mrs. Beamish called out to Bert that she was going for an evening stroll and hurried from the house. There were still children playing in the street and Mrs. Beamish wound her way in and out of them until she reached a small college that lay between the city, within the city gates and the graveyard. The windows were dark and the workshop locked up. But when Mrs. Beamish gave the front door a gentle push, it opened. All the furniture was gone, right down to the pictures on the wall. Mrs. Beamish let out a long, slow sigh of relief. If they'd slung Mr. Dovetail in jail, they'd hardly have put all his furniture in there with him. It really did look as though he'd packed up and taken off, taken Daisy off to Pluritania. Mrs. Beamish felt a little easier in her mind as she walked back through the city within the city. Some girls were jumping rope in the road up ahead, chanting a rhyme now repeated in playgrounds all over the kingdom. Ichabod, Ichabod, he'll get you if you stop. Ichabod, Ichabod, so skip till you flop. Never look back if you feel squeamish, cause he's caught a soldier, call Major 
one of the little girls turning the rope for her friend spotted Miss Beamish, let out a squeal and dropped her in. The other little girls turned too, seeing their pastry chef. All of them turned red. One let out a terrified giggle and another burst into tears. It's all right, girls, said Mrs. Beamish, trying to smile. It doesn't matter. The children remained quiet still as she passed them until suddenly Mrs. Beamish turned to look again at the girl who dropped the end of the skipping rope. Where, asked Miss Beamish, Mrs. Beamish, did you get that dress? The scarlet faced girl looked down at it then back up at Mrs. Beamish. My daddy, my daddy gave it to me, Mrs., said the girl, when he came home from work yesterday and he gave my brother a bandolier. After staring at the dress for a few more seconds, Mrs. Beamish turned slowly away and walked on home. She told herself she must be mistaken, but sure, but she was sure she could remember Daisy Dovetail wearing a beautiful little dress exactly like that, sunshine yellow with daisies embroidered around the neck and cuffs back when her mother was alive and made all daisies clothes.